Okay, welcome everyone to our next lecture on causality. Um, today we look at connections to machine learning, which is particularly interesting because it goes beyond what you typically see in statistics. And there are some really nice ideas which are new. So with new, I mean 2012, but when I read about them, so they were really original. And it's about the question, the difference between causal learning and anti-causal learning. And that's some, something really, some, some new mind opening thing. So, but before, let's have a look, what have we seen last time? So last time we looked at different algorithms for learning cause effect models. And I think you already implemented now one, or maybe on the exercise sheet today, I'm not sure when it will come out. So you will implement them and you will see, yes, they work kind of, but it's unclear whether you can make money with it in a company or something, or whether you can really trust them. But it's, they're better than chance, so it's like a foot in the door. But on the other hand, I also show it to you. Maybe you have a better idea how to improve it, okay? So there's room for improvement. And when you improve it, you can definitely write a paper. So this is like still a difficult task. You have two variables, and you want to infer which is cause, which is effect, just by looking at the uh, scatter plot. So that is the, the task that they're trying to solve, having certain assumptions. And of course, the assumptions um, I can pose and then prove a theory, but then if my data sets don't fulfill these assumptions, right, then the method doesn't work. But if the data sets fulfill these assumptions, so if you come up with reasonable assumptions which are natural, yeah, then you've got a method. Um, today, again, we follow this nice book from Peter Sjansing Schulkopf, and we go on with um, the fifth chapter, even though I think the half-sibling regression, I think that's like on a different chapter. I think it's seven or eight or something. It's further in the back. But I um, add the stuff that you need to know for that one. Okay, so what we did so far was, so I showed you this diagram already quite often. So there are these probabilistic models, basically joint distributions. But we are now interested in causal models, which are much more rich they model more about the data. They not only model what you see, the observations, so the stuff that you get into your Excel sheet, but it, they also model these causal models, what's happening if you do things differently, like for counterfactuals or for interventions, okay? So they are more rich. Of course, from the usual scatter plots, it's hard typically to infer them without any assumptions, yeah, you can't, but with certain assumptions, sometimes you can also do that. And we, we call this causal reasoning to go from the model to observations and outcomes and causal learning if we go the other way around, okay? But sometimes there are other words. Sometimes this is called causal inference, so from the left to the right. And sometimes also from the right to the left, it could be called causal inference, right? If someone uses the words wrongly and um, it might be me in the past. So it is often a, a mix up. That's why I like this learning and reasoning thing here doesn't matter what words people use, when you see someone doing some work on causal inference, you should think of this picture here and you think, which error are we talking about? So are we having a method to go from the left to the right or from the right to the left? And then you have it like on the, on the map. So what are we doing today? We are now trying to use this causal way of thinking, like causal modeling, yeah, and see whether it also has something to do with machine learning. And as it turns out, there's a machine learning, the topic of semi-supervised learning, I will explain what it is. And with a causal view, suddenly we better understand when semi-supervised learning works and when it doesn't work. The other thing is covariate shift. It's also a, a something from machine learning or from statistics. It's all from statistics as well, what I'm saying. And also there, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And the question is why. And with a causal view on it, um, we can answer that. And so we today, at the beginning, we'll talk about causal versus anti-causal learning. And how this is different from the typical machine learning setup, in the typical machine learning setup, you are given an IID data set, okay? And that's it. So input-output examples, xi, yi. And then you're trying to learn a function from x to y. So that's the typical machine learning um, setup. And saying that we have an IID data set is like saying, um, the data points are independent of each other. Um, they, are e they are distributed according to the same distribution. So they come from the same distribution. So those are all assumptions on the joint distribution of these variables, okay, that we observe. 
However, what if we know something additionally, whether from x to y is the causal direction? What can we say in that case? And if the error goes from x to y, we would call it causal learning if x is the input and y is the output. And if x is the effect and y is the cause, yeah, and we're still learning a mapping from x to y, then we will call it anti-causal learning. Okay, and let's look at these two cases, what they mean for semi-supervised learning and covariate shift. That's basically already the summary of the most important stuff in this lecture. Here's an example. I have some hand-drawn figures. I hope you don't mind. So let's take as an example MNIST. Okay, so in MNIST, we have some pictures that we take with a cell phone, right? A matrix, matrix with grayscale numbers in here, and they show an image of some digit. Okay, so this is the image. It's typically represented as a vector in R to the D. Actually, of course, R to the D times D, right? It's an image. But you can imagine that it's a long vector. Those are typically our axes. And in machine learning, we would like to train a function that translates these images into labels where now the label here is really a one, okay? I use the American style of writing ones, so just this line. And that is basically like the content or the meaning of this, okay? So we have these two modalities. Um, so we typically learn a function that takes an image and then tells us what digit it is. And the question now is, for this example, are we learning the causal direction or are we learning the anti-causal direction? And the reasoning here is it's a bit hand wavy. Um, I hope after the following slides you say, yes, it's clearly this or that direction, or at least it's plausible that it's one of them. So what do you think before? Are we learning the causal or the anti-causal direction for the MNIST problem? Maybe you have an, have an idea and can give a justification why you think it's one way or the other way. Or you just have a feeling, I have the feeling that, or something. So let's do it like this. Let's first make a poll. So who thinks it's the causal direction? And who thinks it's the anti-causal direction? And who's not sure? Okay. Oh, okay. So most people think it's the causal direction. Do you mind if, if can you tell me why you think it's the causal direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. There's, you said with a definite thing. So th they, these random variables are very different, right? One is more like um, a continuous random variable in the R to the D, and the other one is a discrete one. So it's a, maybe a not so well chosen example because they, the two variables have so different properties, right? Okay. Any, any, why did you choose causal? Mm -hmm. So that would be my reasoning why it's this is what right. cause and this is the effect. Okay. So they are the, so you're saying basically F is kind of the mechanism then yeah. at the end, right? Yeah. And from this perspective, like the F is translating an image into a digit. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Okay. You also have an F an uh, we, do you want to say a reasoning your reasoning? Mm-hmm. Ah, okay, like this, the F is kind of kind of a mechanism. So you said anti-causal learning. By the way, to give you more courage, I'm on your side. I, I know already what's happening. It is anti-causal learning. So what's, do you have an intuition or was it more like? Uh, no, I was also thinking that it was causal learning, but that would be my intuition and I thought it was easy and so I picked Ah, very good reasoning. <laughs> okay, very good. Yeah, yeah, okay, very good. Um, okay, now I try to convince you that this is not the causal direction. Okay, so let's see. So, um, okay, let me first say it. And uh, so the thing is, if we look at the process, you're right with it's, it's causal that the function then translates it into a label. That's right. But the data set is there, and there's no computer yet. So how was the data set generated? So this is that we need to think about. So the model comes later. And how was the data set um, generated? So we are in primary school, and there's someone sitting and thinking about the question, what is 10 minus 9? And then they think, oh, I think it's 2. 
and they write down a two. So first comes the thought that it's a two, and then they write it down. And of course it's wrong, it's a one. But um, So the ordering is that you first have the, th the one that you want to write, and then you write it. So the mechanism here that generates the data set is there's a certain distribution of digits, which are basically the distribution on the solutions in primary school, for example, or whatever, like the digits that, that come up. It, those could be also results in a basketball game or whatever. Some digits that we have, like someone scoring a goal. And then, OK, now they have three goals. And uh, I update this thing and write it up. And then the mechanism is going from my brain into my motor cortex and controlling my arm and writing the digit on a piece of paper. And then there's this graphite on my paper and my cell phone camera comes and then the light from the sun is going onto this sheet of paper reflected into my camera and my camera is counting photons and then some computation and then I have my JPEG file. So the ordering is, the causal ordering here is really from the um, label to the image in this case. Yeah, I, I, that might be already um, somewhat convincing. And this could be also seen like the data generation process is writing. So people are writing stuff. And the classification later that I'm trying to solve with machine learning is reading. So the machine should try to decipher it and should read it. And so the writing is the causal direction, and then the reading is the anti-causal direction. Yeah? I, I hope this is somewhat, I mean, it's a made up example that I, I came up with. So maybe Jonas will criticize me for that one, that it's not a good one. But um, yeah, I think it's a good one until I get criticized or convinced of the opposite. OK, let's look at some, some how we could write it down. So um, there are two factorizations of the joint distribution. Yeah, The joint distribution of the image and the label in this case. We can always apply product rule and could say, OK, it's p of y times p of x given y. OK, so that's given the label generate an image. That's my story that I just said. And then if we learn now this p of x given y, that would mean we learn to write, OK? And it could be that in one country, we write the one as just something like this, like in the US. And maybe in Germany, you write the one, and you make always the, the, the two lines. So the p of x given y could be different. Yeah? So those are the, um, the style of writing, OK? Um, the frequencies are irrelevant for the mechanism of writing. Yeah? Or think of letters. So for example, in handwriting, we might have some letter E or some letter A. And um, you learn it in England, and you also learn it in Germany, even though the Scrabble distribution is different in both countries. right? So the distribution of letters is very different. So the mechanism of writing is really independent of the distribution of these ones. Yeah? Um, also, it's going forward in time. Forward in time can be misleading if we have a confounder. So if there's one variable which is influencing two other variables, right? it could happen that there might be not a causal relationship between two random variables, but they both originate from the same origin. But it might look one is the cause of the other. That's, by the way, the problem of Granger causality, when you know what this is. So that's a, um, something from econometrics that is sometimes used in time series analysis, where you kind of want to know whether one is the cause or the other. And I think Granger causality has this problem that if they are confounders, so if they are other unobserved variables, um, it's losing some of its power. Yeah. Okay, so forward in time is typically a good thing. Yeah, like that's like where you can make up the story, the mechanism. So for the anti-causal direction, um, we factorize it the other way around. So we can also apply the product rule the other way around. And learning now p of y given x is like learning to read. Okay, it's the other way around. We look at an image, and then again we get the um, uh, we get the label, yeah, or more dramatically, like a writer, yeah, in the 1600s, they wrote some poem, okay, that was the generation mechanism, the writing process, and now we in the 21st century look at the manuscript and we can read it and generate the same thoughts from the reading, yeah, so that's the causal direction. Um, and here the frequencies are relevant, for reading the frequencies are relevant, right? Why is that the case? Yes, because if in doubt, if there are two letters which look quite similar, 
then depending on the language, we might think it's an U or it's an A or so it, it will influence us, okay? So um, the reading also goes somewhat backward in time. So we let the, the machine, uh, the, the time machine go backwards. Someone wrote a poem 500 years ago and now we are reading it and we're translating these scribbles, so these points on a sheet of paper, we again translate it into thoughts into emotions or feeling or whatever, okay? So and this goes backwards in time. Okay, so far so good. I hope this is um, convincing. Let's look at the different distributions, yeah? Let's try to visualize them. And here are more sketch sketches that I have. So for the writing, I have a certain distribution for the P of Y. And those are the Scrabble frequencies, right? Scrabble is this game with these letters, and there are certain distributions. Those are the points that you get for the Scrabble letters. And they are different in different countries. And also the digit probabilities are different. Yeah, there's, I think if you have like random numbers that you take from the newspaper, or if you take random numbers from, from whatever, bills, electricity bills or something, and you look at the distribution, they follow a certain law. So there are more ones than other numbers. And the nines are the ones that are not so often on them. Uh, I forgot the name of this one. Does anyone know what it's called? It's a fun, fun thing from statistics. Ah, I forgot it. Anyway, so there's a certain distribution that can be used to find fraud um, questionnaires. So let's say you should go to the city and ask people for some opinions and you write down numbers and you say, oh, it's too tiring, too tiresome to go to the city. I just sit at home and I fill them out myself to get the money. Um, typically with such a trick, by looking at the digital distribution, they can catch you. So if you want to be really good, you have to have the right digit distribution. Anyway, so the frequencies could be different. And now what about the drawing? Yeah, so this X here is a continuous space. It could be very high dimensional. I just drawn it one dimensional here. Yeah, and so there are some images which corresponds to the one and some images which corresponds to the zero. And we assume now that say they have different clusters. Okay, and those are the conditional distributions. P of X given Y being equal to one, we get, for example, here one Gaussian blob, and for y equals zero, we get another Gaussian blob, okay? We can draw the similar things for reading. So how does P of x look in this situation? So we still have this one-dimensional axis here, but now we have both in the same plot, and those are the images for one, those are the images for two, uh, for zero, okay? Those are two clusters in the same plot. Also here you see already, Ah, interesting. The P of X, it shows something about the two classes, right? So there are two clusters. So the two clusters are giving me hints. So the shape of P of X is telling me something also about the classification, okay? By the way, this shows already that if we do semi-supervised learning, I explain in a second what it exactly is. It's like supervised learning, yeah? So you have examples, input, output examples. But additionally, you have lots of unlabeled data. So you have lots of examples from P of X. And so if they are nicely clustered, that can help you to get a better classifier. Okay? And curiously, if you multiply P of X and P of Y given X, all those two, you get the same distribution. Yeah? By the way, how does it look like? It looks a bit weird, right? One axis is continuous and the other axis is discrete because there's only two values. I don't know how to plot it. Maybe, I don't know. How to do it. It would be looking like these two lines on top of each other, but then normalized overall. So that would be like a, a sketch of the joint distribution. Okay, so we found out the causal direction is the writing, that's the generation generating stuff, and the anti-causal direction is the reading. Um, here are nice examples from Jonas Peters. So I, I stole the digit example from him, um, where this image now shows both. So the um, Green error is the machine learning method. So I want to learn to infer from the X, I want to infer the Y. However, the red error here is the causal direction. Yeah? And um, this is an example for causal learning. So here the generation of the data is going from X to Y, so that is the causal direction. And my machine learning is also typically going from X to Y. So what is the example? So it's something that happens in the cell, a translation process where basically messenger RNA, so that's like just, you can, as computer scientists, we think about it like a sequence of letters, right? 
and that is read out and a protein is gener gener generated or here it's a peptide chain gets generated from this encoding on the messenger RNA. And the mechanism that's doing this is the so-called ribosome. Yeah? So that is like a complicated protein which is translating one representation into another representation. And this other representation, I think these peptide chains and does some complicated folding. You might remember alpha fold from DeepMind. They calculate how the molecule looks like at the end. However, the point of this is that um, the mechanism is going from the messenger RNA to this peptide chain. And we can do machine learning to translate also these letters into these ones. Yeah? So we can learn the mapping in the same direction. And note here that for the mapping, the distribution down here doesn't matter. The P of X doesn't matter for the mapping from P of Y given X. Okay. So this is the overview. So if the true causal model goes from the, uh, the true causal model always goes from the cause to the effect, of course. If we learn the causal direction, we are learning from the cause to the effects. And colloquially, this could be seen like we learn to write. Okay, so we learn to generate data. Learning the anti-causal direction is solving an inverse problem. So it's, again, the cause to the effect is a causal model. However, now we want to invert it. So we want to infer from the effect something to the cause. That's something that's very common in scientific inquiry, right? So you, you have some observation, and then you want to infer something about what is behind. For example, if you have an MR scanner, yeah, magnet resonant, magneto resonance, what is it called? I, what's the I for? MRT in German, MRI in English. So basically you are um, you're having your body in 3D and you're making your measurement by putting some radiation through it and you measure basically the pattern that you see when you put radiation through the body and you do it, do it from many angles and doing some fancy stuff. And then from these projections, you're trying to infer the 3D um, structure of the body. So there's first the 3D structure and then the measurements. So the causal direction is going from the body to the measurements. However, then when I want to have the 3D thing on my screen as a, um, as a medical person, then I need to invert this problem. That's why it's called an inverse problem. Okay. And that's like learning to read. So in that case, I'm trying to um, learn something, the anti-causal direction. Okay. Good, so far so good. Let's look at two examples in machine learning and see how the learning to read and learning to write pops up here. I think you understand everything already by now, maybe, but if not, so here comes the details. Semi-supervised learning, so what is it? So typically in a supervised task, a regression task, yeah, we have some pairs x, y, where now the y doesn't have to be a discrete variable. So that was the classification example. But the y could be a continuous number too, and the x could be a continuous number. And then the task in regression would be predict y given x. And I think the statistician would say regress x on y. Is any statistician among us? Or do you say regress y on x? I cannot remember. So you say one of them, and I'm always confused. So let's say you regress y on x, or you regress x on y. I forgot. So it's easier to say we want to predict y given x, okay? So that then the direction for me is clear. Um, then, for example, if we have the L2 loss, just some mean squared error between them, okay? And we want to minimize it, yeah? Then one can derive the minimizing function to be the conditional expectation, okay? And this is just from statistics. Don't worry about it. That is the best solution that you can do. However, for this best solution, what you need is you need, of course, the joint distribution or at least the conditional distribution. However, what we see here is that for the regression task, all that we need is P of Y given X. So the best solution ju needs just P of Y given X. That's it for the regression one, okay? So in supervised learning, we are giving a set of data points from a joint distribution, and the L2 regression needs to estimate P of Y given X, right? Then we have solved it. Of course, in machine learning, P of Y given X could be a neural network, and then it's not really a distribution, but a deterministic function, right? But there are also neural networks from which you can sample, okay? So it's not really something different. Now, in semi-supervised learning, we have additionally some examples without labels or without outputs, 
So we have a big data set additionally. Um, there are also samples from the joint distribution, but I don't have labels. So they're really coming from P of X. Um, why is that a very common example? Uh, let's say you want to do video classification machen on some video platform, okay? Then maybe you have some videos that are labeled or annotated, right? So where people put in here, okay, this is whatever, cooking videos, putting in the eggs and then frying it and whatever, yeah? But then there are many, many, many videos that don't have annotations, okay? So you have some data points like this and they are really expensive. You have to hire heavies or some other people who label stuff. And then there's lots of unlabeled data. So semi-supervised learning is really promising for these kind of applications. However, the hope behind semi-supervised learning is that the P of X is telling us something about P of Y given X. Otherwise, um, we, we couldn't profit from it, okay? And this hope only holds under certain assumptions. So here's a simple example of semi-supervised learning like graphically if uh, that I copied from, I think, from the Wikipedia page. Um, so let's say I'm having two labeled examples, those two. What could I say? I can draw a straight line between them and say that is my classifier, okay? However, what if I have lots of unlabeled examples? And let's say they look like this. So the gray ones are all the unlabeled ones, but they look like two moons or two boomerangs, okay? And um, here we would say, yeah, then probably the, 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 um, the separating hyperplane should look like this. Okay, so here in this case, we see from the unlabeled data how we better make the classification. So we learn something from the P of X in this example. And what are the assumptions that are mentioned? I think I got it from the Wikipedia page of some review paper. Maybe I should look up where I got it from. So there are certain assumptions under which semi-supervised learning holds. And one is the so-called cluster assumption. So the assumption is that the distribution P of X is somewhat clustering the axes in different classes, okay? That is something that helps for semi-supervised learning. Another one is there's a low density separation between the two classes, which is basically the same as the cluster assumption. So low density just meaning, so you have the P of X and between the true classes, like the density is very low. So there are not many points at the boundary, okay? Um, so basically where my P of Y given X is around 0.5, yeah, that's, that should be an area where the P of X is very, very small. So that's very equivalent to the clustering assumption, right? Because if that's the case, then I can do clustering. And another one is semi-supervised smoothness assumption. That's yet another one, and there's an A missing. Okay, interesting. So let's think about that one. The conditional mean that is written down here should be smooth, where P of X is large. Okay, so what is P of X? P of X is where we have lots of data, for example, inside a cluster. There is P of X large, okay? And between clusters, P of X is small. So inside a cluster, I want to have the conditional mean to be smooth, to be a smooth function. So what is the conditional mean? That is exactly this regression solution. So plugging in an X, what is the average Y for a particular X? And if this function is smooth, it means by fiddling around with the x a little bit, the y doesn't change a lot. So basically saying inside a cluster, you should have the same label. So that is basically the semi-supervised smoothness assumption. So it's yet another one. And of course, each of them deserves a paper, and people have written papers on it. But like they have, some, uh, they have a lot in common. Yeah? OK, in causal words now, yeah? It means that the cause and the mechanism, the P of X and the P of Y given X, they should be somehow dependent on each other. Maybe I should rewrite this, not the cause and the mechanism, but the basically the P of X and the P of Y given X, they should somehow be dependent of each other. And again, the dependence is not on the level of random variables that something is factorizing here. It's like some meta independence on the level of distributions. And they are not independent of each other because there is a statement which is true where both appear. So in this statement, we have the conditional mean and the conditional mean contains P of Y given X and the statement contains P of X. So there's a relation between the two. Similarly here and similarly over here. Okay. So um, 
those three are all examples of situation where the p of x and p of y given x are not independent of each other. Okay, and the curious thing is now, if um, I'm learning in the causal direction, yeah, then this corresponds to the fact that the p of x and the p of y given x are independent mechanism. Let's, again, this is in quotes, yeah. They have nothing to do with each other, so none of the semi-supervised assumption should hold, okay? And that, if that's the case, then semi-supervised learning shouldn't work, okay? One can empirically test that. I show it on, a, on the next slide, I think, yes. Um, on the other hand, learning the anti-causal relation now, it would be nice if there's a relationship between them, and actually there is. So x is actually the effect and y is the cause, so there was somehow the y was generating the x. And that typically means that the p of x might contain information about the p of y given x, which, are, which is the case that corresponds to these statements that we've seen on the previous slide for semi-supervised learning, okay? And um, people did a meta study, I think it's from the paper from, yeah, from Schulkopf, 2012, um, where they tried to support this reasoning experimentally. And you see, it's like carefully phrased, they try to support this reasoning. So like mathematically speaking, yeah, it's so obvious it shouldn't work. However, when you look at real data, things could be different. So I guess those are all, um, each column here is a different data set from the um, UCI repository. Those are some benchmarks for machine learning. Yeah, and there might be the CARS data set. I forgot what it's called, CARS. There's like data points where every data point is a car. And then it says how much horsepower it has, what's the um, miles per gallon, and what's whatever, these kind of things. And then you can think of for two variables, for example, okay, the amount of horsepower is the cause, and the miles per gallon is the effect, okay? So there are these relationships where you use your world knowledge. And then there might be other, other things, there are some weird data sets, diabetes is some data set, I think maybe with some illnesses or stuff, or some um, uh, symptoms and some illnesses, and then there are some, some other mushroom data set, some weird data set where you might come up with a story which is the cause and what is the effect. So they basically sorted them into causal and anti-causal data sets or learning problems. And um, the first one, for example, I don't know what that one is, BASC, those is, that is an example of causal, a causal data set. And as it turns out, the relative decrease in error was negative. That it only got worse with trying to do semi-supervised learning. It never got better. And here are other examples that are red. These red stars, they are all clearly causal data set. And in all these cases, like, semi-supervised learning didn't help. Then there are the blue points. And the blue points, most of them are above the line. However, the statement most of them are above the line is only holds for the first ones. So they are all below the line. So here also the semi-supervised learning hurts a little bit. So the statement is not completely clear from this evaluation. Yeah? Um, and then there are these X's. Those are like data sets which are kind of unclear. Yeah? Um, maybe that would be a nice bachelor thesis or something to redo this with some new data sets and to trying to redo the plot. So that could be interesting. However, today in times of SK Learn, maybe that's too easy. Maybe that's better an exercise for one week. Okay, I'm a little bit exaggerating, but it's easy to do. So you could try it. Yeah? If you have a data set, you could take MNIST, and then you could see whether semi-supervised learning helps. For MNIST, it helps. That's known, I think. I think everything works on MNIST. Um, but there might be more interesting data sets where you then see a difference between uh, whether it helps or whether it does not help. So far, so good. So this is semi-supervised learning. Now, the causal thinking here yeah, led to let these Schulkopf and colleagues, so those are the same, I think, as on the book and maybe some others, um, to get like new insights for semi-supervised learning. Like before there were these assumptions on these cluster assumptions and blah, blah, blah. But by thinking about it in terms of causal models, suddenly we have a much better understanding, right? whether semi-supervised learning works or not, or when it works. So we have kind of a more general point of view. Um, however, still what's lacking is a good definition for P of X is independent of P of Y given X, right? So this is still kind of shaky. And we have many examples, 
but there's not the theory behind that kind of really tells us what it is. Of course, um, the, the lab in Tübingen, they also did quite a bit of work using Kolmogorov complexity and some really fancy information theoretic stuff. So they're trying really, really, really hard to make a nice theory behind this. Yeah? So maybe I should check back with their papers whether they solved it or not. Yeah? Okay, so now comes a twin, a dual of semi-supervised learning. So it's not really a dual in the sense that it's like obviously the other way around, but at least with respect to causal, anti-causal learning, it's the other way around. So for semi-supervised learning, it works if the anti-causal direction is learned. Covariate shift, it's the other way around. It works if you learn the causal direction. So what is covariate shift? First of all, what is a covariate at all? So if you are not from the statistics department, you might not know what a covariate is. There are many words for um, things in machine learning. We always, I, my favorite thing now for something like this is x is the input, y is the output. I think that makes it most clear in my head. However, you could also call the x a covariate. Yeah, so the inputs to a linear regression, they are called covariates, okay? And I forgot what the output is called. Oh yeah, this, oh, okay, it, the dependent variable. Yeah, the, the y is also called the dependent variable, where again, dependent now means it's dependent on the variables x. Um, where does this dependence come from? In a way, it's coming, for example, in social sciences from domain experts, right? There's a domain expert and they say, yeah, we know these factors influencing that one. Let's measure the strengths. And then we say, OK, the so y is the dependent variable. It depends on the other. So some sort of causal reasoning behind the scenes, I guess. And the inputs are sometimes called the independent variables. But this has nothing to do with independence, in my opinion. OK. And there are many other words. So there's regressor and regressant, OK, or controlled variable, predicted variable, and so on and so forth. Um, again, my favorite is input output. Yeah, so that's the easiest one. Um, okay, so covariate shift now means somehow the distribution for the x is changing. Yeah, so I might have training data with a certain p of x, but then I have test data where the p of x changed. Yeah, so in a regression task, I'm giving some data from a joint distribution, and I found a function that predicts y given x. So this is my training, yeah, and I minimize some loss. However, at test time, I have a different loss. I have a different distribution. So my test locations are changing. Yeah? So I have a different distribution. And this is now called covariate shift because the distribution of the covariates, they shifted. Again, you might think, OK, I never thought this is an interesting problem. So how did people come up with? Typically, these kind of questions, they come up from applications. Yeah? So for example, the, a company is giving you some data set. And they say, yeah, come, can you train me a classifier from x to y? And then you do, and it takes half a year. And then they apply it, and it doesn't work at all. And they ask, so why doesn't it work at all? It's, it's basically the same problem. However, their distribution changed by that time. So maybe they bought a new machine or something. Or again, let's talk about these medical applications. You have an MR scanner, and your university have S1 with whatever, five Tesla or something, a big one. And you train your reconstruction algorithm particularly on that machine. yeah, And then you say, great, let's have a company, or let's sell it to Siemens, this algorithm. And then they try it on their machine, and it doesn't work. And so what changed might be the input distribution. Okay, So there might be a covariate shift. That's why people are interested in algorithms that might be robust against covariate shift, Okay, that can also deal with simple changes in the distribution. OK, um, again, let's look at the causal direction. So in the causal direction, the distribution of my inputs and basically the data generation yeah, of the output, those are independent mechanisms. Yeah? That basically means if I learn something like p of y given x or some regression function, yeah, it does not depend on p of x. OK, so if I learn it, it also works for a different p of x. Yeah. An example where, where it doesn't work might be the MNIST digits or reading, right? Reading a handwriting. That depends very much on the letter distribution because it's helpful to know the letter distribution. That helps you to distinguish between an L and an E, for example. 
So we see that because of this, covariate shift shouldn't have a problem yeah, in the causal direction. For, uh, in the anti-causal direction, that's very different because now if I learn the p of y given x, it contains information about p of x. So if my p of x changes to q of x, then my p of y given x might change as well. Okay, so in the anti-causal direction, the covariate shift shouldn't work or might not work. Okay. Good, here's a simple example. It's a toy example. Um, let's look at it. So um, this upper thing are the examples. I, I don't know how to make it now larger in, in LaTeX. It's a bit painful to put a plot in, in a slide with letters. So this is a training distribution, okay? It's like a um, mixture of two Gaussians. So there are two Gaussian bumps, same height. And this is my distribution of the X. And one class is the left bump and the other class is the right bump, okay? And now my um, test distribution is basically the same, but the relation between class one and class two has changed. So that also means my P of X has changed from having one, uh, two equally high bumps. Now one is high, the other one is low. Okay, so the distribution changed a little bit. So mathematically, we could also write it down like this. Let's say the label is a coin flip. Okay, so zero or one. And then we could say X is equal to the outcome of the coin flip plus the Gaussian distribution. So this is generating me like a mixture of Gaussian in a very simple fashion. Of course, here you need to do a, some casting, right? So you need to cast the integer number to a real number and then everything will be fine. It's a bit weird that you can write it, but since those are numbers and not true and false, you can do it. Okay, so P of X then is a mixture of two Gaussians, S on the picture. And now if I learn the function that translates the X, so any point on the X axis into a label, I will find the boundary that is exactly halfway between these two bounds, bumps, okay? So this is exactly the separating line here. However, now suppose my test data comes from a different mixture of Gaussians. So they are the same, the same bumps, but with different heights now, okay? And in that case, this will shift my boundary yeah, from the um, one, yeah, which was this one, towards the zero. Yeah? So if one bump is higher, then the other thing will shift to the other side. Okay, so far so simple. So we see that learning um, the anti-causal direction, in that case, covariate shift will destroy my answer. Yeah? And of course, this is like a super simple toy example. You never know what's happening in high dimensions, so it will be worse typically. Yeah? Okay, so far so good. So here's first summary. So suppose I'm having data from a joint distribution and that's typically the situation the set up for machine learning. I'm having IID data, so it's coming from one distribution. Um, thinking about it causally, there are two ways to factorize it. Actually really being causally, I should say, there's a structural causal model for one direction and a structural causal model for the other direction. However, for me, it's easier just to write down this factorization and say, so one corresponds to the causal one or the other factorization is the causal one. And the goal in machine learning is then to estimate a function from X to Y. And we typically don't care because uh, which is which, right? However, in the case we are learning really the causal direction, then P of X and P of Y given X are independent mechanisms. There was an example with the messenger RNA. And in that case, semi-supervised learning is likely not to work at all. If it works, that would be super curious and you should definitely analyze the data set and find out whether you found a new assumption for semi-supervised learning. Because the typical assumption for semi-supervised learning, they are incompatible with the first statement that P of X and P of Y given X are independent mechanisms. Yeah? So I guess you won't find a data set where that is generated like this in a causal fashion and where semi-supervised learning works. However, covariate shift is no problem because you're really learning um, the mechanism that translates the X into the Y, okay? So no matter what P of X is, the thing will work, okay, which is good. However, of course, there is an influence, right? Typically, your machine learning methods is tuned for the area where you've seen data. Yeah, you've seen data maybe in a particular part of the space for X, and then you learn a function there and the error is very small, 
but let's think of a polynomial um, in linear regression, it can go to plus infinity, minus infinity, like if you are outside the area where your support is, where the data is. So if you are at a different location now that is very far away from your P of X, of course, in that case, also the classifier might be very, very bad, arbitrarily bad. But in principle, there's hope. If you are not too far away, yeah, if you are close by, there's hope that it's doing some reasonable job. In particular, it's also motivating in this case and transfer learning in a way, right? So you could say, yes, if I'm learning the causal direction, maybe transfer learning might be a really good idea because the problem that I have to solve with a slight shift of input distribution, yeah, I can use the old solution as a starting point and then I just adjust it. So I don't have to start from scratch, but I take the solutions that I already have. And this would be an example of transfer learning. Um, if I'm learning the anti-causal direction, okay? In that case, P of Y and P of X given Y are the independent mechanism, but typically the distribution of the X and my mapping from X to Y are somehow coupled. Again, somehow coupled in, in quotation marks. So this is this undefined thing. And an example is the MNIST data set and doing classification. In that case, semi-supervised learning can profit from this coupling, yeah? And that's super useful if you have unlabeled data in abundance. However, covariate shift might not work at all. Okay? So far, so simple. Yeah? From, but for me, this paper from 2012 was really an eye-opener. I never thought in context of machine learning um, about the cause, causal models behind and what influences or what, how does it influence basically the, the skills of my machine learning methods. And I think there's a lot to discover in machine learning with this kind of thinking. Yeah? Even though it's from 2012, I'm not sure how common, common knowledge this is. Okay, the last example I want to show you, I need to introduce now something from the next lecture. And what do I want to introduce you? Structural causal models for more than two variables. Yeah, we do it next time again, and it's very simple. Yeah? I show you in a second. So a structural causal model so far had only two variables, a cause and an effect. And so I needed only two mechanisms. If I have more than two random variables, for example, 10, okay, of course I need 10 assignments, right? And I can write it a little bit more general. So each of these assignments gets a noise variable as an input, and then I have some parent variables. So this is a set of direct parents. So in a way, there is a, um, a directed acyclic graph on these random variables. And then my mechanism is basically using the incoming arrows for the inputs to the assignments. Okay? And um, the rest is just explaining what you see here. Typically, the distribution of the noise variables is then assumed to be um, pairwise independent. Okay? And that's the same as we had before. And you can imagine what the next lecture will be. It will be about this one, and we talk about intervention, and we talk about counterfactuals. And it will be very much as before. Okay, so far so good. Um, given such a structural causal model, so there is a causal graph behind it, right? Which are just, as I just said, this directed acyclic graph that is um, defined by the non-cyclic assignments. So far so good. There are also cyclic graphs, by the way. There's um, Joris Moy, another former colleague of mine in Amsterdam, and um, he's looking at the case causal models with cycles, which is fascinating. Yeah. So then some things are really different. Um, okay, those are just some wordings. We don't need it now. Um, what we need maybe is that a structural causal model for several variables, of course, induces also some probability distribution over all these variables. Yeah. As usual, it's the same thing as before with more than one with more than two variables. Um, Here's another nice picture from the book from Jonas Peters. So the causal model, yeah, the structural causal model, what does it buy us? It gives us a causal graph. So that's something we can read off. It gives us observational distributions, right? It gives us the joint distributions. And it also tells us a lot about different interventional distributions. OK, you are the physicist. You are thinking about some physical laws. And basically, you are after the structural causal model that is describing how everything works together. And then in your lab, you're doing experiments by intervening on these things. Yeah? So by changing stuff. You want to see 
you want to calculate how fast things fall down, so you make experiments and you manipulate the structural causal model and try to measure, make nice observations that tell you something about the structural causal model. However, in your brain, you can also do counterfactual, so you can also ask, so what if things are different, okay? And that's also built into the structural causal model. Okay, these superpowers, of course, they come at the price that from typical observations, you cannot easily infer the structural causal models. So this, a structural causal model is, for now, a mathematical object, which you sometimes can obtain if you have some expert knowledge, as we will see in the next example. So we look at half-sibling regression. That's chapter or section 8.1 from the book. And there is also an ICML paper, so that's a machine learning paper, called Removing Systematic Error from Exoplanet Search via Latent Causes. So this is really hot stuff, right? So these are techniques that can be used for the search for exoplanets. So you know exoplanets? So this is if you have some other star in the, on the sky, most likely they will have planets, right? But it's very hard to see them with the telescope. They are just too small. And we are happy that we see all these stars. But it would be really weird if our star, the sun, has planets and all the other stars out there, they don't have planets. So that would be really, really strange. So there is this hunt for having an experiment that kind of says there must be an exoplanet on that one. And ideally even calculating properties or gases or anything like this. So this is a big topic. And by working together with astronomers, so I think this one, Schulkopf, Peters, Jansing, Simon Gabriel, they are from machine learning, and Hawk, Wang, Foreman, McKay, I think those are, um, at least Hawk is uh, an astrophysicist from New York University or something, and I don't know where, where these two colleagues are. So they work together, and they kind of cleverly combined some causal intuition and some causal insights with some physical problem, okay? And the good thing is, it's so easy, you can understand it. And they gave it a good name, half-sibling regression. Yeah? So first of all, how do you search for exoplanets? Yeah? So it works like this. So there is a star, and you assume some planets are passing by. Okay? They must really go in front of the star. If, the, if there's a solar system up there with a star where the planets go like that, no chance for exoplanet search so far, right? You need better ideas to see that. But by chance, I mean, you can calculate the probability that this happens. So for a certain percentage of the stars, if they are all randomly oriented, some of them should kind of go in front of the star. And this should create a little dip in the light curve of the star, okay? So there's this Kepler Space Observatory, yeah, which is looking at stars and it's making time series of the brightness of the stars. And they are looking for little dips in there. And now if you have a little dip in here, yeah, one dip might not be very important, but if this dip happens every 100 days, yeah, and consistently you can predict there will be a dip in 100 days, then it's best explained that there must be a planet passing by, okay? Which is really clever. However, of course, this is an, a nice picture, right? So the data is super noisy and it's very hard to see. And so maybe you need a lot of averaging and you need to find the right offset. And then you do one experiment, you predict some, whatever, some times that it goes around the star. And um, then maybe you say, I really only trust these numbers if they predict me for the next year all these events again and the data looks the same. So I'm not only retrospectively looking at data and finding some numbers, there's always a danger of overfitting, but there must be have some predictive capabilities as well. And then you can do it. You also see that, you, that it's easier to, to pre uh, predict some planet which doesn't take so long, right? I think, I don't know, Jupiter and Saturn, I don't know how long they take to go once around, I forgot, hundreds of years, some, 160 years or something, one of them, I don't know by heart, but these um, big gas planets outside of our solar system, not outside, but at the very far edge, they take very long. And so for our telescope, so it would be a very long experiment to, de to detect those. However, smaller ones we can detect, maybe like Venus or maybe like Earth. So those are the most exciting ones. Okay, so far so good. Signal is super noisy. So any denoising method is appreciated here. The thing is now the key idea, Kepler is not observing a single star, 
but Kepler is observing all stars at the same time, right? They take a video of the whole sky, or at least of part of the sky, and then there are many, many stars, and so they get simultaneously many time series, okay? In principle, the stars are really far from each other, and they should be statistically independent of each other. So now comes the domain knowledge in here. So the light curves should be independent of each other. However, suppose there's some outburst of our sun, yeah? then maybe all the light curves get shifted or get some extra noise. So there might be causes which are affecting all the stars simultaneously. Okay, so this is the setup. Um, can we profit from this insight? Yes, we can. Um, in particular, Kepler is measuring like 160,000 stars at the same time. So there must be something that we can do with it. Instead of looking at each curve individually, we can look at them simultaneously. And here's the graphical model. So there's an, some unobserved true signal Q. Okay, so this is a true light curve. Uh, if we would go there with, a, with a, some plane or something, with some starship, and we could be really close to the sun, we would observe this signal Q. If we go to some other star, we would observe the signal R, okay? However, we only have these very bad measurements, Y and X, that are measured in, in this Kepler observatory. However, there might be some systematic noise on both of them. And this systematic noise might, have, might originate um, from some close by stars, or maybe from the sun, or maybe it happen. But in principle, there are some systematic noise which can be in any of those, okay? And now the thing is, curiously, it looks like so there must be part of Y which I can predict from X. So all the stuff that is kind of transferred via the noise, yeah, so the X has some predictive power about the Y because the X contains the same noise as the Y. So now I use the, the phrasing of Peters because it's so good. So we denoise the observed y by removing all information that can be explained by the other measurements. And this is called half-sibling regression because y and x are half-siblings in this picture, right? They have the same father but maybe different mothers or the other way around. Okay. So half-sibling regression is saying my estimate for q, so my q hat, is y. That's the best that I have. But now minus the expectation of y given x. Okay, everything in y that can be explained with x, I want to subtract from y. That's definitely something that must be some systematic noise, okay? And this is half-sibling regression, which I also find quite interesting. And again, I think the researchers only came up with this idea because they had like these causality ideas in their head. And this really led to new methods. Yeah? Um, you can prove some mass. So I don't go into the detail. I also find this equation somewhat cumbersome, but they are comparing basically the error that you get from Q minus its expectation, Y minus its expectation. So they compare these two numbers. Okay, so the error between the Y and the Q after we remove the means, and they compare this error with, um, compared with our half sibling regression result. And they show you can only decrease the error. You never increase the error. Um, it, if they are really independent, if y and x are really independent, we will have equality, and it doesn't matter whether we remove it or not, right? Because then the conditional expectation here will be zero if they are independent. However, if there is something in here, it can only help, OK? OK, so that is a quite a fancy method from um, that where, which, which combines machine learning and causality and physics. Yeah? And there are some more details in the, in the book. OK, so that is the overview of today's lecture. And today we are early. So we looked at semi-supervised learning and covariate shift, which are two machine learning methods. And we looked at it through this causal perspective. And we got some new insights. And I also showed you a completely new method, which kind of originates from this kind of causal thinking. There are some other interesting causal inferences related to machine learning, which is related to reinforcement learning. That's in the book, so there are two chapters, and I omitted them. Okay, that's it for today. I think we stop here and continue next time.